and he describes it in one paragraph so beautifully that I thought I'd read it for you. And here it is. I'm now I'm reading at a section which, uh, if you have a reference to a 67 CD, all right? All Platonic dialogues, when they're in print, have these numbers along the side. They're called the Stephanus numbers, so you can check it. In the Loeb edition, which I have, it's found on page 233. Hmm. Now, remember what we're going to look for. Something described as a purification, that's a separation of the soul from the body, such in the way I just described it. That's going to be called death, and that's going to be called a practice, something that you have to do, something you have to learn how to perform. It has to be developed as a custom or a habit. And does not the purification consist in this? Which has been mentioned long ago in our discourse? something I've been talking about for a long time. In separating as far as possible the soul from the body and teaching the soul the habit, uh, custom it, habit, of collecting and bringing itself together from all parts of the body, okay, from all parts of the body, and then living alone. by itself, and what's most interesting now, so far as it can, both now, see, both now, and hereafter. It's a practice of learning it both now and hereafter. Freed from the body as from fetters. That's the goal. Well then, this is what we call death, is it not? A release and separation from the body? Exactly so. But as we hold, true philosophers, and they alone, are always most eager to release the soul, and just this, the release and separation of the soul from the body. Is that their study or not? Obviously. Then the true philosophers, True philosophers practice dying, and death is less terrible to them than to any other men. Now, what do they want to do it for? What do they get? What do they get for, by that separation? If he's really a philosopher, he will confidently believe that he will find pure wisdom nowhere else than here in the other world. The other world now is being described as, from that point of view, when the separation takes place, that experience is wisdom. Now, I have a couple more examples of what that means. But if this is what the philosopher alone does, then he's the only one who actually knows whether you can do this before you drop dead. Now, if you can pull this stunt off before you drop dead, then you know that there's the possibility then of releasing the soul from the body by this yogic, the spiritual discipline, and only the person who are willing to try it and do it can talk about whether or not it's possible to do. It's also only possible whether or not now you can uh, experience the state of wisdom by such a separation. Ah, therefore, Socrates alone as the philosopher is the one then who then engages in this separation and slays death. He then can slay death and therefore all the fears of death. Because if you know that there is a separation of the soul from the body, you can survive then there's no basis for a fear. Now, the 14 around him, 
during this discussion, not one of them understands what we just read. None of them can deal with it. Because they have a dominant fear of death that blocks them from even understanding what we just went over. Therefore, Socrates takes now a second voyage where he now has to overcome their fear of death by discovering what ideas do they have that are so fearful that blocks them from understanding what we just went over. Ah, let's go back now. If Theseus is a hero, then he went with the 14, descended through that labyrinth, found the Minotaur, slayed the Minotaur, then returned and became king. Is it Socrates now the archetypal, the ideal? Is the philosopher, the, is Socrates the philosophical hero? And is the philosophical hero's task to slay death now as well as hereafter? so that therefore he can have personal experience of whether the separation of the soul from the body is possible or not? If he is, then he knows whether or not this is real or not. No one else does. And therefore Socrates then takes the 14, slays death, but then what must he do? He must now deal with their fears. And all he can show, <laughs> the only thing he does, is to show that their fears are groundless by examining the arguments they have. If he can show them the arguments that they have are illogical and really don't follow what is said about death, then they are in an interesting situation of being able to discover that their arguments, which are so fearful about the nature of death, are not meaningful, but they may still fear it. They may st and Socrates says, yes, that's right. I can take you through this argument. You can see that the grounds for your fears are groundless. And there's only one thing I can do, he says, for you. He says, you have to go back over it again and again and again, because you have to see what premises your very arguments depend upon and examine those. So going back to the myth. So therefore, it looks like we have something curious going on here. We have a deliberate use of myth, the Theseus myth. But now you see, in Plato's use, he has the commemorating this event by going to the island of Delos. Delos is sacred to Apollo. Now, everything said about Apollo can be gathered together into a very coherent picture and if you're interested in checking this, you'll enjoy reading Marciad Iliad's Shamanism. Let me just cite it for you, all right? Shaman, Shamanism, Marciad Iliad. He has a section on Apollo, and he says the Greeks were really shamanists. They had this, this whole development of shamanism, which is a kind of the, uh, a natural development of a spiritual system very akin to the yogic systems, but it emerges spontaneously in all people. And this particular development of shamanism, he says in the Greek world, is basically Apollo-based. And part of it is the separation of the soul from the body, the very thing we're talking about. Now, all through this dialogue of Plato's, we'll see that the ideas of Apollo brought together into unity, every one of them can be found in the dialogue, the Phaedo. Everything that's said about Apollo, you can find someplace in the dialogue where that very issue is explored. Therefore, there are two myths going on. The, the, the hero, the hero represents the ideal, and the major figure in our